Happy Sabbath, church family. It's so good to be with you on this Sabbath day. I want to encourage you uh, to greet your family and your friends that you're gathered with right now. Hopefully not too many in the room, but with your family in your pajamas, go ahead and stand up right now and greet one another and say hello to each other. Happy Sabbath, and I'm glad you're here. Take a moment now to do that with each other. We were just talking a second ago about the new normal in which we are in. Hopefully this doesn't continue for too long, but we're praising God this morning that we have the use of technology and the ability to join you in your homes or wherever you are gathered today. We've come to worship in spirit and in truth, and we don't dare do so without asking God's presence to be with us, if you will pray with me at this time. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, which the Bible defines as being new every single morning. God, we thank you for this special weekend that we are a part of. And while it might not feel like a normal Easter Sabbath, God, we are still able to celebrate what you have done for us over this weekend. The fact that Passover was last evening, the fact that today, the Sabbath, you rested, and that tomorrow we're celebrating the resurrection. God, we can do that from wherever we are. And God, for all of eternity, we will continue to celebrate those things because of your goodness to us. So God, may your Holy Spirit's presence be with each of our members, with everyone that is watching this virtual church service today. God, I thank you that we are a part of a church family that is relational, that is caring for one another, that is reaching out to one another. But God, I also thank you that we're a part of a church family that can worship together as well. So God, even though we're not in one place, may your spirit unite us in praise and affirmation to you. Bless us now as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In the wonderful and beautiful name of Jesus, amen. amen.
O Father, which art in heaven, truly thou art God. Truly, you hear our prayers. Father, we are in a time of distress right now. I have friends. We all have probably know someone who has lost their job recently or that is struggling with the virus or an illness. Lord, we know that you are there with them. You know that you are aware of what's going on. We just pray, Lord, that if it be thy will, you intervene in their behalf and you supply the things that they need. You supply health. You supply finances. You supply courage during this time. Lord, I just pray that those of us that can, that you'll make us willing vessels and able to help those who are in need. Lord, we are grateful, Lord, that you have provided something for each one of us. Hope through the giving of your life, your son, that we might have the hope of eternal life and we can look forward to a day where there is no more suffering, no more pain. Father, please be with us and hear our cry. Forgive us of our sins and turn us to thee. Ask in the name of the mighty Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Can you praise God together with me, church family? What an amazing God we serve. Such a love that he has for you and for me, that he came to this world, that he died the death on the cross, that he faced separation from his Father to be raised into glory. And church family, this is what we are celebrating today. And so I want to thank each of our musicians that has sung. It was amazing to see the, the girls leading us in music today. What a blessing it is to be able to worship today in spirit and in truth. And that's why we gather. That's why we spend time doing this, is to bring encouragement and to bring hope to you during this time. So we praise God that you're with us. We're so grateful for this opportunity to be able to share God's word with you and with many others. As we've said in weeks previous, one of the things that you can do during this time is share whatever platform you're watching this on, share it on social media. From our first couple of weeks of worship service, we've had several thousand individuals that have witnessed some part of what we are doing. And that's nothing to do with us. That's to God's honor and glory that may seeds for his kingdom be planted. So please join us in sharing this with your friends, with your family, with anyone you think might watch it. In fact, I was talking with one of you this week and you were telling me that you were able to share this in ways that you didn't think previously you could invite someone to church with you. Praise God for that. It's a very non-threatening way to be able to share encouragement and hope with individuals. Just share the link, share the on your Facebook wall, or if you have YouTube, bring it into your Facebook and share it that way. Send it to somebody, because we want others to be blessed with the truth that we share so deeply together. Again, it's good to be with you today. And I have to tell you, church family, that yesterday I spent time in worship. Now, not just time in worship, I spent time in worship. I had about a two-hour segment yesterday where I was in God's Word, where I was listening to music, I was singing music, and as you know, I don't sing so well, so you know I must have been moved by the Spirit at that point. I spent time talking with Him, and I spent time being quiet and allowing Him to talk to me. And church family, I was so encouraged by this time with God, just refreshed and invigorated and very ready to share a message of hope and encouragement with you today. But I want to encourage you, make sure you're taking time to do this as well. Make sure that you're taking time to worship God during the times in which we live because there's plenty of challenges, there's plenty of obstacles, there's plenty of things that can take our faith and our hope from where they should be. But if we allow our hearts and our minds to drift to the things of God, I guarantee that you will be encouraged. So take time to worship, even as we're doing right here now, this morning. Worship is so important during this time, for God truly is doing amazing things. My sermon title this morning is Resurrection, the Ultimate Deliverance. Let us pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you once again for the privilege of being able to share your word with people who are eager to hear it. God, I pray that as we share words of encouragement from Scripture, as we share inspired thoughts from you, I pray that the spirits of those listening, those that are watching, those that join us after the fact, will be uplifted. Because God, what we're talking about is your son, Jesus. And we praise you for him and we thank you for him. And it's his reckless love that we are singing about, praising and worshiping today. God, may you overwhelm us with that love in such a real and tangible way that God, even in our homes, even whenever or wherever we watch this, we have an experience and encounter with you. We thank you. And my prayer is this. Open my mouth that my lips may declare your praises. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, I have to talk to you for just a second this morning. You saw a video, if you were with us for Children's Sabbath School, that said there's a word that you're going to be looking for in the sermon. And that is the, any form of the word deliver. Deliver, delivery, deliverance. And I want to have you pull out a piece of paper and just make check marks or tick marks and tally it up to see how many times throughout the course of this sermon you hear the word deliver. Now I know I've said it a bunch right there, but I want you to start the timer with that right now. So anytime I say the word deliver, mark it down. My sermon title again today is Resurrection, the Ultimate Deliverance. Easter weekend has always been one of my favorite times 
from the significance of Passover as we prayed, to the day of rest in which we're celebrating today the Sabbath, to the resurrection that took place on Sunday morning. There's so many things to praise God for specifically this weekend. The resurrection, the ultimate deliverance. And while we can't physically be together today, we can certainly dive deep into the significance of this weekend and we can praise God for what Jesus did, our Lord and Savior, what he accomplished for each of us. So why do we celebrate? Why do we talk about hard times being able to celebrate? We celebrate because Jesus is risen. We celebrate because Jesus has risen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open. We're going to be spending quite a bit of time today in Matthew chapter 28. Turn there with me if you have your Bibles. The words probably will be on the screen as well. But if you have your Bible, look at it there with me together. I'm reading from the NASB today. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10, and then we'll come back and break them down this morning together. This is what the Word of God says. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guard shook with fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will find him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. And watch what happens. It says, and behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take the word to my brethren. Leave for Galilee and they, there they will see me. What an amazing story we just read. This is the encounter of when they first found Jesus risen from the dead. I think one of the challenges that we have is that we hear phrases like risen from the dead so often that we don't understand the significance of what is taking place. But I want us to look at this story in detail this morning because I believe it will be an inspiration to us during this time. So I want to break it down kind of verse by verse or section by section. So the first two that I want to look at is uh, verse 1 and verse 2. And this is what the Word of God said again. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, pause. We have to stop right there because you can picture this scene with me. As soon as the light peeked over the hill, these women were looking out of their windows and they take off towards the tomb. I can imagine they were up hours before this because they were preparing things to get Jesus' body ready. So they were making sure they had everything. And as soon as light broke, they were going to the tomb. And I love this picture, the eagerness in which they are there to go see Jesus, possibly to see if he had risen possibly just to prepare his body, but either way, they didn't waste any time on Sunday to go and see what was taking place. What a beautiful picture. But verse 2, this is what he, maybe one of my favorite parts of what we're looking at today. And it says, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Now, don't miss this with me, church family. What it's saying is that this earthquake, as the angel came down, the earth started to shake. And it's amazing because you see the two responses of what happens when they encountered the angel. Both were afraid, but one overcame that fear and became excited, and the other became to the point of death. It says they were like dead men, just lying there, in shock at what had taken place. 
But I love this picture. This angel comes down, rolls away the stone, and then what does the Bible say? There in the last part of verse 2, rolled the stone and sat on top of it. What kind of thing is that to do? Sit on top of the stone. But I love to picture this scene, and I want you to imagine it with me at home. A scene that took place in heaven. The angels are stepping forward for the greatest assignment that was given to the angels up until that point. And the angels had done some amazing things. They had announced Jesus' birth. They had ministered to people before. They had announced good news. Many, many things that the angels had done. But this, the greatest assignment, when God said, I need someone to go move that pebble out of the way, the angels jumping up and down, I want to do it, I want to do it, who's going to get to do it? until one is selected to go and be a part of this mission. You see, the way that I picture this scene is like this. Many times when I come home and I walk into my front door, I hear from wherever my children are, Daddy's home! And I hear their footsteps running, running, running to come and grab onto my legs. I love going away so that I can come home, so that I can hear their excitement at coming into the door. Now, I'm not excited because I know one day this will stop. I can't picture them when they're older running up to me and grabbing me by the legs. But for now, I treasure that. When that moment comes that they no longer do that, I'll probably have to go and get a dog. But until that day, I'm going to enjoy my children running up and grabbing me. Oftentimes, they tell me what mommy is cooking or what they ate for lunch. Sometimes they tell me what they did during the day. Daddy, we did a craft or daddy, we played a game. And once in a while, they'll ruin a surprise. My wife might have been working on something, or the mailman might have dropped something off. Daddy, we have, and I hear my wife in the background, no, shh, wait. And they have this eagerness to tell me what is going on in their lives or what is taking place. So eager to share what the surprise or the good news is. And I picture this angel from heaven like that excited to be the one to share the good news, so eager, in fact, that he sits on top of the stone and picture this. Maybe the angel is imagining who's going to be the first one. Who's going to come? Will it be Peter? Will Peter be the first one? He's usually the one that rushes ahead. Will it be the disciple John who self-declaimed as being the beloved of Jesus? Maybe the angel thought it could be Mary. Jesus had spent a lot of time with Mary. Mary had invested in the ministry of Jesus. Maybe it was going to be someone else that he didn't even know. But whoever it was, I can imagine the anticipation. I got to tell. I got to tell. I want to tell somebody the good news. And this is the, how I picture this scene. The angel excited to share the news of a risen king to share the news of the plan of salvation and redemption, to announce that it was a success, that they accomplished what they had set out from the moment sin entered to obtain, to declare that Jesus had obtained victory over death. You have to see this from God's word today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 I can picture this angel delivering news like this to whoever the first person to come to the tomb was going to be. You know this passage of scripture, but I can picture this being the message in which he wanted to give. It says, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is the power of sin, is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss this, church family. This is the news that this angel wanted to announce. It wanted to tell whoever came to the tomb first, Jesus has risen and has obtained victory over sin and over death. Now, I know many times it doesn't feel like he's already obtained victory, and that's because we still live in this sin-filled world. But we can claim the victory of Jesus that he accomplished because it gives us hope to a day when we will see that fulfillment come to be, when we will reap the benefits of the victory that Jesus has already obtained on the cross. And this is the news that the angel longed to tell with whoever the first person to come to the tomb was. Can you picture it with me? 
Can you see the excitement of this angel to announce the greatest news ever announced? I hope you can. The Bible gives even more detail to help us understand it. Verse 3, And the appearance was like lightning, and the clothing was white as snow. Now, there's not many more things in this world as brilliant as lightning. And if it's too close, in fact, it's actually terrifying to be able to see the power of nature, to be able to hear the crack of thunder that follows and see the amazing expanse of the sky as lightning rips through it. As Matthew was writing this gospel, that's the best language that he could choose to illustrate what this angel must have looked like. In clothes as white as snow, shining brilliant at all around. I can imagine as they got close to the tomb, they saw the reflection of this angel. It might be the first thing that they saw. As they shielded their eyes, they saw that the stone was moved and that the light was coming from on top. I can picture this scene so vividly. Again, we see this description here of how the guards that were standing there took the news, but we can also see how the woman took the news in a, just a second. In verse six, or verse five, excuse me, the angel said to the woman, don't be afraid. I know it's a lot to take in, but don't be afraid. I know that you have come looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He is risen. Beautiful words of scripture. He is not here, he is risen. This is the foundation of Christianity. He is risen. This is the linchpin of our faith. He has risen. We have confidence in the things that Jesus said to be true because the fact that he rose from the dead. He told us before it happened that it would happen, and it did. Because of that, we can have full confidence that anything Jesus said will come to be because of this fact. He is risen. So when he says things like John 14, 1 through 3, we can take it to be gospel truth. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. You see, he didn't say don't let your hearts be troubled only when things are going well. Only when things are good, he said, at all times, do not let your hearts be troubled. And if we actually believe in the words of Jesus, we'll take him at those words during this time. In the middle of this pandemic, we'll claim promises like this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, he continues. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That way where I am, you may be also. Church family, we can take confidence that when Jesus says those words, he is risen. It is true. It came about. It is fact. So don't let your hearts be troubled because we know that this pandemic, whether it's over tomorrow, next month, or goes even longer, whether recession comes, whether hard times happen, whether we lose our jobs, do not let your hearts be troubled. We as a body of Christ will help one another. We'll take care of one another because collectively we're looking forward to what Jesus is going to do. Come again and take us to be with him. And we have that confidence because... He is risen. He has delivered us from sin. The ultimate deliverance is the resurrection of Jesus. We can take full confidence in the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, when Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many of you could use a promise like that during this time? How many of you can claim the words of Jesus that what you're going through right now seems heavy? Try him. Take him at his word. Take his load on, and he will more than gladly take yours. 
Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be weighed down by the burdens of what is taking place. Rather, come to Jesus and find true rest. Allow him to take your burden. I had prayer this week with somebody who stopped by the church, and we were six feet away. Don't worry, church family. But we prayed for each other. I prayed for her that God would bring deliverance to her, that over this resurrection weekend, that she would find the joy of being set free by Jesus. And she left from the church excited and singing God's praises. We're going to talk more about singing God's praises in just a second. But the thing that I want to stress is that she took the promises of God seriously, as do we all. We need to claim these promises during this time because Jesus longs to help us experience the way things really are, not how sometimes we get confused and think they are. And there's so many more promises of Jesus that we could look at. But what I want to stress is that we can take Jesus at his word because he is risen. You see, there's two moments that all of us must come to in our Christian experience. The first one is the moment that we realize that Jesus died for me. You see, it's not just an ethereal idea somewhere up there, oh yes, Jesus died. Really what we're talking about is that Jesus died for me. Jesus died for you. We oftentimes call this our conversion experience. Many of us remember the story in which we first discovered this. Some were at their low points, some were in the middle of going through routines, some were overwhelmed by burdens, and they realized that Jesus died for them. But the second moment that all of us must come to is the moment that we realize that he obtained victory at the resurrection. You see, that's what gives us confidence and hope to move past that first experience, to continue to go deeper with who God is and what his desires for our life are. These two moments make up our experience of Christianity, when we first came to Jesus and when we continue to come to him because of the fact that he resurrected from the dead, having obtained victory on the cross of Calvary. Those two moments give us courage daily to face the hardships of this old life. It's what gives us our focus to be able to realize that one day a time is coming where we will not experience the challenges that we currently experience. A time when we will be able to praise him more fully. When I think about this picture, I think of a psalm that David wrote, Psalm 139. It's this beautiful passage of scripture that I'd like you to memorize if you get a chance. Psalm 139, verse 14. That we, like David, will be able to claim this promise because of the assurance of the resurrection. It's, this is what the Word of God says. Psalm 139, verse 14. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. I love this language that David is using here, and as you've seen over these last couple of weeks, I've been in the Psalms heavily, learning all that I can, experiencing all that I can, worshiping with David, experiencing God in the same way. And I love what he says because he affirms, wonderful are your works, O God. Maybe one of the most wonderful is what you're doing in my life. And he affirms this because he says, my soul knows it very well. My inmost parts know, God, that you are truly good. And I think one of the reasons for that is because of the victory that God has given us. And church family, oh, how I long for the day when we will see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. Church family, I long for that day where things will not be like they are anymore. What good news we have to share with each other and with those who are not yet here. Beautiful picture. The angel continues in verse 6. Come and see the place that he is laying. Go quickly afterwards, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. I love this part of the encounter for two reasons. 
I love it because he gives some context to what is going on. The first thing he tells them is, do not be afraid. The second thing he says is, he's not here, for he has risen. And I can imagine, like most in this story, there might have been some, some shock, some amazement, some bewilderment. Well, it's too much. I don't know how to understand this. I don't know how to think about this. And so what the angel does, and this is brilliant, church family, don't miss this. The angel says, come and see for yourself. Come inside and see for yourself. I love this because what was left in the tomb, if you look at the four resurrection encounters in the Gospels, you see that there was his head dressing, there was his burial clothes, and they were folded neatly on whatever slab he had been laid on. So the angel is saying, hey, go inside and see that his body isn't here. After that, he says, go and look at the clothes. They're folded neatly, not on a dead body. And I love this picture because he invites us to come and reason together, to think through these things, to examine these things together. But it's not enough just to examine them and to look at them because like some with the disciples, it says that as they came, they scratched their heads being puzzled. Luke 24 says that they were bewildered or they were puzzled by what was taking place. And sometimes, church family, that's where we stop in our experience. We come, we come together, we examine the clothes, we look at all of the details, we, we search everything out, and then we say, well, I don't know, something happened, but I don't really know what it was. And this is something that we need to spend time talking about as a church family. You see, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we've put a lot of time and effort into understanding last-day prophecies. Many of you would be able to give me timelines and draw significant dates that connect to other ones and show me the Bible passages, and you understand the information. You understand the timelines. You can quote the scriptures, but we have not spent enough time talking about how to live in those times, how to minister in those times. You see, it's like we went inside of the tomb, started studying all of these things, and then forgot what comes next. The next part is the most significant part because the angel said, go in the cave, but then come out and go tell other people what you saw. Go tell other people what it is that you've learned. And that's why during this time, virtual church is still so important because we can dive deep into God's word, we can be encouraged for ourselves, and then we can take that and share it with someone else. I'd be saddened to know that if we preached a message where I gave Bible promises and Bible hope, that you just held on to it for yourself and didn't share that with somebody else. And I praise God for you, church family, because I know you're not like that. I was talking with one of you this week that says, almost every morning as I'm spending time in the Word or as I'm reflecting on the sermon, I text 30 to 40 people a word of encouragement. I said, every day? He said, every single day. I said, that's amazing. We need more encouragement like that. So take some of these passages that we're looking at, share them with others because they need hope in Jesus as well. Don't stay inside of the tomb, but rather as Jesus, or as the angel says, and soon Jesus will say, go and tell others. Look, but go. Come and see, but don't stay. Leave from that point. The amazing thing about this story, had they stayed inside of the tomb, as we often have done, they would have missed what happened next. What is the next thing that happens when they walk outside of the tomb? They see the risen Jesus. And I love this illustration because Jesus says in the book of Revelation that he is standing at the door knocking. All we have to do is open the door and let him come in. In the case of what we're talking about, if we would just step outside of the tomb, we would be able to experience an encounter with Jesus. Don't spend so much time looking at the clothes and studying it and examining and understanding everything to the nth detail and miss that Jesus is right outside saying, come experience me, come worship me, and then go tell other people about me. 
This is what Jesus tells them. Verse 9, And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. I love what the Bible is explaining at this point. It's explaining what they did when they saw Jesus. When we leave the tomb, we encounter Jesus. When we encounter Jesus, we fall at his feet to worship. Jesus rose so that we may be delivered. And when we are delivered, there is only two appropriate responses. When Jesus gets a hold of our heart, when Jesus inspires us anew, there's only two things that we do from that point. The first is we come and we see, which is our act of worship. We gather together and worship in spirit and in truth so that we can go and tell other people. This is evangelism. We worship so that we can share the good news with others. Let me give you maybe the best biblical illustration of this coming from the Old Testament. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Many of you might not think of worshiping coming from this story, but I want to explain a key principle when it comes to how we worship and how we tell others, or when we encounter Jesus and how we respond to that encounter. A little, a little bit of a backstory or history or context of what is taking place. Exodus chapter 14, my Bible heading says, Pharaoh is in pursuit. We know that the children of Israel had just been left out, let out of Egypt, right? We're celebrating the Passover this weekend. The angel of destruction came. The firstborn that did not have the blood over their doorposts were not spared. Those that took Jesus at his word and put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost were saved, right? We understand this. This is symbolic of the blood of Jesus covering our lives. Well, this is what prompted Pharaoh to let his people go. So all of them gathered their things. And the Bible says even some Egyptians came with them and said, we don't want to stay there. We want to go with you and serve your God. And so they pack up their stuff, they pack up their animals, and they begin marching out into the desert towards the promised land. Well, there was an obstacle that they ran into, right? You know the story. The Red Sea was between them and where they wanted to go. And so they camp. Well, all of a sudden, they start to see a dust cloud far in the back, and somebody with good eyesight, right, looks and sees that there's chariots and horsemen carrying spears that are coming after them, and there's only one logical conclusion. Either they're coming to kill us, or they're coming to take us back into slavery, but either way, what they do here is amazing in the wrong way. Verse, uh, let's look at verse 13. No, excuse me, let me go to uh, 10. It says, As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, and then they said to Moses, It is because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you dealt with us in this way? Bring, why did you bring us out of Egypt? This is not the word that we have spoken to you in Egypt saying, is this not the word that we had spoken to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Now again, you know the context of this passage, right? They had been in slavery for hundreds of years, 480 years they were in slavery. There was a prophecy predicted that a deliverer would come and set them free. Moses is out in the wilderness, sees the burning bush, and God says, Moses, I want you to go deliver my people. Moses goes, he leads the people out, and now the people are saying, it would have been better for us to still be slaves than it would be to die right here next to the water. It would have been better for us to die next to the water. Can I preach this morning, church family? I feel like preaching this morning. I got to share a word with you. Watch out for complaining. Watch out when life circumstances get hard and we take our eyes off of Jesus and we begin looking on the problem and the obstacles around us because we too, like the children of Israel, then start complaining and saying, we were so much better off before. 
But the thing that they miss by spending so much time complaining about what is taking place is about what God was about to do. Watch out for worrying about how things are right now because it takes your mind off of what God is about to do. Watch out for complaining about the economy or your job or the situation or your livelihood or the fact that you're at home or any of the number of things that we have to complain about right now because it causes us to look at self and become overwhelmed by the problems and miss what God is doing. Look for what God is doing more than what is taking place around. And Moses, being the spiritual leader at this time, got this. So Moses said to the people in verse 13, Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Stand by for the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see again. What a prophecy. Moses is standing in front of a people afraid, in front of a people worried that see the dust cloud getting bigger and bigger, and they start to hear the shouts of the Egyptians coming to kill them. And Moses said, hey, you see them now. You'll never see them again. Don't worry. What? They're about to kill us. And Moses tells them in verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You keep Silence. Mercy. Church family, watch out. If I'm stepping on toes today, I apologize. Sometimes the best thing a spiritual leader can do is tell his people, be silent. Stop complaining. Stop worrying about what is taking place because you're not seeing what God is about to do. I want to encourage you that God is doing things during this time. God is active and moving and is real during this time. God is doing something in the midst of this pandemic that I have never seen in my lifetime. People are so receptive to spiritual conversations. People are so receptive to what God has done in your life that they're willing to listen, they're willing to engage, and I've had prayer with people I never thought would even enter into a conversation about spiritual things, asking God's blessing and peace to dwell on them. Be quiet and allow God to work. Now, I'm not necessarily even talking about the words that you're saying, but your soul, your spirit, be quiet and allow God to move. Allow God to work. And church family, you know what happens next. They step back, Moses stretches out his rod, and the Red Sea parts. Again, you've got to picture this scene with me. They're standing there with their enemy at their back, an immovable force in front of them. All of a sudden, God moves the waters out of the way to the extent that they're able to walk through. God's deliverance is about to come. God is about to deliver his people in such a way that when they got to the other side, there was only one appropriate response that they had, and that is to worship and to praise we don't have time this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't have time this morning to read Exodus chapter 15, but this is a fantastic song or passage of scripture to read as your family. Go on YouTube, look at videos of this song. There are many of them. We didn't want a copyright infringement, so we didn't put it in right now. But go and look at those videos and see the amazing things that God did. Just the first two verses of this psalm. It says, then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him, my father's God, and I will extol him. Church family, this is the response that we in this day must have to the fact that Jesus resurrected and gave us the ultimate deliverance is to sing a song of praise. We come in, we examine the details, we see that it is indeed true and that it, it did indeed happen. And after that, we come out, we worship God, we sing this song of adoration, whatever that may be, you want another good activity to do as a family? Write this song of deliverance for your family. 
Maybe some lines of how God has led. Maybe some ways that you've seen him work. If you're non-musical, just write them down, maybe a poem. If you're musical, put it to words. We'd play it here gladly if you write something. Your family's song of deliverance. How has God led and blessed and worked in your life? This is the response that we are to have to God, a song of worship, a song of praise, an acknowledgement that God is working in our lives. Church family, take time today to share the good things that Jesus is doing in your lives. And if you can't see anything around you, then claim Jesus rose from the dead. Oh, death, where is your sting? Right? This is the promise that we have. Jesus has led us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has delivered us. We, like the children of Israel, will be victorious we too will ultimately have a song to sing. And in closing, I want to share this song with you. This song that it talks about in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. It's this beautiful picture that is taking place in heaven. My Bible says a scene in heaven. Now the first scene in heaven we saw today was the imaginary scene of the angels raising their hand. That was my sanctified imagination. But this one is inspired. John is actually taken up and is able to see a picture, right? Sometimes we refer to this as a fly on the wall, right? John is taken up and he is able to see what is taking place in heaven. And he sees the elders and the creatures joining together in this song. You know this song well. Verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. It says that they sing this song continually because they realize who Jesus is. They realize what he has accomplished for them. And the text continues, there's this unmeasurable number that lay their crowns at the feet of Jesus because he's the one that has obtained victory for all of us. And we all sing in the song, Worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Oh, friends, don't you want to be ready for that day? Don't you want to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory and have the same excitement that the ladies had when they ran back to tell everyone else about Jesus? I want to be ready for that day, and I pray that you do as well. We worship a risen God, a God who is soon to come back and take us with him for all of eternity, an eternity that does not resemble anything like we are living in now. Do you want that? Do you want God to perform such a way in your life that your only response is to sing his praises and to ultimately go tell someone else what God is doing? I pray that you do. As you hear this closing song, uh, we'll come together and pray afterwards, but as you hear this song, gather with your family, gather with those that are right around you, and spend time in prayer. Spend time praying together right now, even if this music is going, that you are accepting the deliverance that God has offered, that you're accepting what he is doing in your life, and that you long to see him come in the clouds of glory together.
Let us pray. Father God, Lord, your goodness to us is almost unimaginable. That the love that you had for us would cause you to come to this earth, to die a death that you did not deserve, but that all of us do. An unimaginable death that we can obtain victory because you rose from the dead. God, we thank you for that deliverance. We thank you for setting us free in your son, Jesus. We thank you for what he accomplished on that cross and in that tomb. And God, we too long like those ladies to walk out of the tomb and to fall at your feet and to worship you. But God, until the physical day comes where we will lay our crowns at your feet and we will join in the song with so many other, those that realize that you are their Savior and Redeemer. God, until that day comes, keep us faithful, keep us dependent on your word, keep us focused on what you are doing, and God, help us to be able to encourage others, come and see, and may the Holy Spirit do the rest. God, bless our church at this time. Bless each family at this time. God, as I believe families have come together and prayed and renewed their commitment to you, their excitement for you, their passion for you, God, I pray that you will continue to make yourself real to each one of them. We love you and we thank you. And it's in the beautiful name of Jesus that we ask all these things. Amen. Church family, I pray that you've received a blessing today from God's word. I pray that there is something that we talked about today that you can go and share with someone else. You see, that's really where the message of Matthew 28 ends, is to go and to tell others what Jesus is doing in our lives, to be able to share from our testimony the deliverance that we have experienced. So I pray that this week you have an opportunity to minister to others. The last thing that I want to encourage you with is we still have a stack of our Sabbath school lessons. I'd love for them to get into your hands. They don't do any good sitting on the table. So I will be here tomorrow from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock to distribute those lessons, but maybe more importantly, to have conversations with you, to be able to pray with you, to offer words of encouragement, or just to sit and to listen to what you are going through. So here at the church, from 2 to 4, we'll have a drive-through time of prayer and Sabbath school material distribution. May the Lord bless you today. May you enjoy the Sabbath day rest. And tomorrow, may you continue to celebrate that He is risen.